<laughs> thanks, thanks for coming. Um, uh, let's see. I got to the end of the first draft of this movie uh, at the beginning of 2012. And uh, then I did. I had knew no one in the industry and said, okay, and, you know, I do music. So I was like, I'll, I'll make an album that's named the same thing and talking about the same stuff. So we did that in, in a, you know, in a ploy to try to bring attention to the screenplay. And that didn't work. And so we and I ended up having to put it out and tour it and to, to pay bills. And that went on for a couple years. And, and then in 2014, I was walking on the street in San Francisco and ran into Dave Eggers who's, uh, and, um, and asked him to read it to give me notes because at that point I was like throwing up my hands saying, well, maybe I'll just put it out on the internet and let people read it. But I wanted some notes, you know, to get it tighter. And he, he said, hey, let me put this out on McSweeney. So in 2014, uh, we published it on McSweeney's as it's in screenplay format, but as its own paperback book and packaged with the McSweeney's Quarterly that went out to 10 or 20,000 people. And that, the, some of the reaction from that got me, you know, with a, a second win to try to get it going. And I joined SF Film as a filmmaker in residence. Then in 2015, I uh, joined the Sundance Screenwriters Lab. Um, they also brought me to the, that same year to the Catalyst program to pitch to investors. Then 2016, I got into the uh, Sundance Directors Lab, and then we shot it last year. So, um, you know, if you had told me it was going to take this long, I wouldn't have uh, done it. You know, so I... <laughs> So, you know, started writing it, it in 2011 and seven years, but it was seven years of, oh, this is about to get, we're going to shoot in three months. So, um, you know, that, that little piece of cheese helped me keep going, and I'm, I'm glad everyone's able to see it. Um, I wanted to make this movie. I didn't want to just be a filmmaker. I wanted to make the movies that I wanted to make. And so this is what we came out with. So thank you for being here. We're going to talk more about it afterward. All right. Thank you. Hey, man. <laughs> All right. What's up? <laughs> Howdy, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that fantastic, fantastic movie. Um, I'm going to start off with a question in this regard. As a former telemarketer myself who has a white voice, as you can all hear now, where did the idea of the white voice come from? I mean, it, I did telemarketing as well, and uh, it was something that you had to do. I mean, no one had talked about it, and just you, you figure out what to do to, to get more sales. Um, and some of it was like, just on the, hey, I'm just like you sort of person, sort of thing, or also just as much as, uh, it, it, it also would be like, you can trust me with a credit card. You know? Right, like, exactly. Don't, you know. Um, so it was real weird. Like, we'd be calling to, we, I was doing, the second time I did it, it was actually telefundraising. So ostensibly better, you know, uh, ethically, but not really because even though we we're calling from the Bay Area, we'd be calling for the LA mission right. um, to Orange County, right, <laughs> to raise money for the LA mission. And uh, so I would always uh, like, you know, just using, you know, that's the thing is like you use your creativity in these jobs in, in ways that, 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 just lie to people. So I would have a pitch that had something to do with like, hey, so um, we heard that that we, we want to know, we're doing this survey to see if if uh, your house is one of the houses that got broken into this week. And they're like, what? No. Oh, 
So it wasn't, okay, how about your car? And they, they would be like, no, what are you talking about? And I said, well, there's been a rash of break-ins, and we just want to know um, if you've been one of them. Because we have, and, and they'd be like, no. And we're like, well, okay, I guess our plan is working. And, um, and, what, and they, they'd be curious, and I'd say, well, what we're doing is trying to move all the homeless people out of your neighborhood and bring them to downtown Los Angeles. Wow. Give them, teach them, give them God, teach them how to bathe, and get them out of your hair. Because, you know, the police aren't going to work. You don't want more police in your neighborhood. It just makes you look poor. And, you know, uh, I'd always get the money. But you, it would, and, and you could kind of be like, well, it's to raise money for a homeless shelter, so that's cool. But then it's also just putting out these fucked up ideas. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that sort of thing, like, gave rise to I mean, there's the so ideas. many ideas in your film, which I one of the things I really appreciated about it, we were talking earlier about how it's unpredictable. And I think in a day and age where it feels like you kind of know how movies are going to go, was like the white voice, where, what were the things that like when you were kind of sitting there and creating this universe and creating this world that were the starting points? Was that it? Was that was it like the character? Was it like the, no. the wild kind of horse no. <laughs> thing all, at the end? All I knew was that it was going to take place in the world of telemarketing. There was going to be a struggle on the job that the main character had to decide what side he was going to be on. Um, and then I had the first scene, uh, and usually that's kind of how you start an idea is because you, you got the opening scene. So, um, so I had the, the first scene, which was uh, how my boy Rob Ebo got all of his jobs and he never got caught. And so I, that was my opening scene. I had that. And then the compliment argument was something that, you know, that, that happened to my little brother like years before. And so for many years, I was like, I'm going to put that in a movie one day, putting that in a movie. And that, um, but all the fantastical, you know, things that, that and absurd things that happen in the film. Um, happened because I needed to put these situations in a larger context, right? I needed to, I needed to uh, put why, you know, the white voice was being used into a larger context. And how do you do that? How do you, you know, uh, or, or the feeling of, of, you know, that he's having when he's, you know, calling, you know, I could have easily just had him say, hey, I really feel like I'm invading people's houses. It saved us some time, right? Um, but I wanted people to not just empathize with Cassius. I wanted them to go through what he was going through. And, and so that happened. Then also with the other things, the larger philosophical ideas, you know, there are ways that you, you know, usually the way that I see people doing that is they say, well, you know why this happens? It's because of this or whatever. You have some, some um, expository thing happening in the dialogue, and I hate that. It just, you know, it bores me to death. And, and, and then you s that's where you're like, message, you understand what, you know, that the director is talking to you now or the writer is talking to you right now. And so... Those things started, I started figuring out those things, how to do that visually or sonically and how to, and, and so once I realized that that was a useful thing, then I, it's more started happening. And then um, once I got, and, and then I, I was taking the journey with Cassius, basically. I didn't, I didn't know necessarily what was going to happen. Um, and, you know, I didn't have a deadline, so I was just like, okay. Let's see where this story is going to go. Um, and then when, when I got to the party scene, I knew it was about page 50-something. I needed to get to the point. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I, like, I needed him to see himself. I, I, I needed him. I didn't want him to change based on his friends don't like him doing this thing or 
or his girlfriend tells him the right thing to do. And, you know, I didn't want him to change. I didn't want her to be her job to be to change him. Right. And I didn't want him to change that way because I don't think that's how people change. Um, I think people change in relation having to do with what they think their power is and, and who they think they are and all of those things. But it has to do with themselves. And so I needed him to see himself. And I, that was the reason at first I wrote the rap scene. And um, so I wrote that. I knew that it was funny, uncomfortable, and said a lot of different things that I wanted to say. But I had already created this crazy heightened world where he's selling slaves. So how would all of a sudden him realizing that uh, you know he's that that he's there to perform? you know, some version of blackness for them. How would that be? You know, it didn't, wouldn't make sense that that be the thing that turned him around. And I think a lot of films can, would get away with it. Like, if I would have made that be the turning point, it would have been acceptable. Like, because we've seen a lot of movies do something like that. And, uh, but I wanted it to feel real to me. So I was like, I need... I, how is he going to see himself cutting through all of this madness that I've already set up? And I knew I needed it to sh shake him to his mortal core. Right. And, uh, yeah. So. Well, you know, interesting, you're talking Horse people. Of, yeah, exactly, horse people. That's how you get there, right? Part of the creative process. Um, a lot of what you're talking about, though, gets to my next thought, which is, like, um, a fan of your music for so long, and it's very overtly political. And in a climate like today, all these acts, especially creating art, is so political. And here, to me, is a very political movie talking about labor, talking about all these kind of things. Can you talk about like how you were able? I mean, obviously, it's a part of the way you view the world and your being. But how you were able to bring that into the creation of this movie, and especially the 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 character of Cassius and what he goes through. Um. I can tell you what I think I, I do. I, I, I think I try to just be honest to, with myself and the way that I view the world. I think that that's the, the best way to do that. You're, you know, like, to, you're, you're, if, and I've understood this with my art. Like, for instance, I hate a lot of art that I may politically agree with um, because well, there are a few reasons, but one reason uh, has to do with with um, missing that aspect of human engagement that really, that just comes from how someone personally interacts with the world, and 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 sticking to certain phrases and certain you know lanes of of theory that have already been laid out. And then you try to make this piece of art that says this thing that you heard someone saying. And it really, I don't know, it doesn't ring true to me. And so I realized long ago with, with my music that the best thing for me to do is to make something that is personal and real and to make sure that I'm being honest with what I feel about the situation. Um, and, and, and so, for instance, it's really easy. You write a love song, and there are many, there are a few different things that make a love song up. Like, um, do you love me? I love you. How much do you love me? Do you love me more than that person over there? Um, how long will you love me? You know, other, different things like that, and, and that, that qualify as a love song. But in real life, you know, it might be something like, you know, I, I really like hanging out with you. I like the way you dance. Um, I really like having sex with you. And can you not laugh like that in front of my parents? Because it feels weird. And I don't know. You know, but if you put all those things in there, it would be like, that's not a love song, love right? Song. No. Because... <laughs> Even though it's more true, yeah. or a breakup scene, you know, you write, 
you, you, we've seen a lot of breakup scenes over and over to where if you sit down and try to like transcribe the breakup that you have, often it won't seem cinematic because it doesn't fit into these things. And, 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 or like I've never been to Delhi, but I have this picture in my head of Delhi uh, in India. And I've never been there before, but I can picture exactly what the street looks like to me, what the sounds are, what the things people are wearing and all that. And if I have to write a scene that happens in Delhi, I'm going to write it based on that. But in reality, that picture comes from a James Bond movie or something like that. And so I've realized that I have to interrogate where, what, when I'm creating something, what I actually feel, what my actual um, experiences in life are. And if I can do that, then my view of the world is going to be connected to that. And my views on the world are going to come out. I don't have to be like, I'm going to make this comment on how these two people relate to each other. It's going to be based, uh, and, and I, I'll, I will have some consciousness that I'm doing that, right. but it'll be based on something that I've experienced and so therefore not feel as um, cliche. Yeah, you're working off a premise of honesty is a starting point. It's funny. Um, I'll ask one last quick question before we open it up to everybody. Is uh, um, I, I sit there, and obviously, again, it's such a bold vision. And you know you're in Los Angeles here, and this is a place often with our art we we sh uh, we steer away from the bold vision. Is there a piece of advice that you got that was particularly terrible, or anything that even though obviously you know that like what you wanted to do and you were able to like cling to your vision, were there things that you heard that were just so insane that would have ruined the thing the your your oh, moving your vision? Oh, a lot of them. Um, the I we were talking about this earlier. The the the. the 40 on two that was like get rid of that we're going to the we're going to do a whole setup and be be at this location just for that joke why do we need it we know he's poor that's good you know like get rid of that so um things like that all these little details that to me are what it's about are what makes it real what make what makes it different that's what gets smoothed out often, especially with independent films, because the, there, this idea, this question of what does it do to, put the, to push the story forward? I think, I understand why it's there, but I think that that's just a certain way of looking at how you make film, and that's a certain style. It would be like asking a new painter, like, why are you putting that smudge right there? What, why do you need that smudge? Because I like it. it. It makes me feel a certain way, right? It makes us feel a certain way. It gives us an idea of that world. And, you, and, and, and so there are different reasonings for these things that, that we're taught to get rid of, and especially when it comes to budget. So there were so many things like, you know, that, that little things that would have got cut because they would save time like um you know the, the the thing crashing down like why do we need that we don't you know we've seen you know just show them on a split screen you know various things like that so i don't know the you know somebody also told me um somebody that i really like as a person so i won't call them out but this is they're very you know entrenched in hollywood and very successful and they told me, look, this is really a love story. Cut out all that extra stuff. It just needs to happen in the telemarketing office. And, uh, and you can have the union struggle, but have it be, have, have Detroit meet Cassius at the telemarketing place. We need to see them meet. Because when, when they break up, that's the only way we're going to feel it. And then, yeah, and get rid of the Equisapiens, get rid of um, get rid all of these movie. other stuff. Yeah, you basically. Know. And, you know, that, that was their advice. It wasn't like they were my boss or anything. They were really giving me heartfelt advice yeah. about what they thought, 
made a good story. Right, right. All right, we'll open up now. I think there are microphones out there, uh, or somebody, we can make sure somebody gets a microphone if there's somebody who has a question for Boots. Hello, my name is Joy Leo Worley, and this movie came out my senior year. I'm a college student now here, but um, I was part of a teen talk show, and we made a whole talk show based off of code switching because of this movie. And I was wondering if you thought code switching was necessarily a negative thing or if it was necessary in some aspects of life. Um, well, I, I definitely think uh, that we're all performing in some way. There is no, like, I don't think there's, like, a, there's no true performance of self because culture is actually just whatever culture is actually just whatever a people do to survive, right? Like we're speaking English right now. And that's, you know, is that good or bad? Obviously, we're speaking English. There's a history to what brought us here and all this. It just is, right? And, the, and, and there's code switching happens because people need it to happen. They need to survive. Now, do we think, should there be a different world in which you're not trying to escape racist assumptions by uh, switching up how you talk? I wish it was that. There was that, and, and I think the rest of the movie talks about how we make a world in which the, the people ha democratically have uh, power over the wealth that they create with their labor. And that's the only way we're gonna have a world in which um, attempts to start working at the problems that, 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 that code switching is a temporary, uh, tries to, to, to avoid temporarily. Um, but yeah, so I don't, I don't think, I don't think the, it wasn't my intention for the film to put a, um, it, it wasn't really that it's, it's, a negative thing is that it just it happens, and that comments on how that comments on how um, racism works in the U.S. But if, if it's not a question of should someone do it or not, it's the fact that people have to do it is the is the uh, is the important. It's not like you're less real if you're at your job and you do this thing because you think that it will. Um, that that it'll it it'll um, get you more sales is is commenting on how race works. I think it also, um, to be clear, I think it's also making a comment on what that code is that we're switching. That there's an idea of not just blackness, but that whiteness is an idea in and of itself, that whiteness is this thing that is performed, that, 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 that has certain things that, that, that are trying to be said with that, that everything's taken care of, that, um, that, that there aren't any problems. And, uh, and that, that's not because it's real, but that's the performance of whiteness, which is a counter to the ideas that are put out, the racist tropes that are put out about people of color, which are look, which which are stuff like, look, these folks are savage. They don't have a culture that helps them succeed. Their family structure is messed up. Uh, they're just lazy or things like that. And those racist ideas have a utility, which is why they exist under capitalism. They have a utility of saying that poverty comes from the mistakes of the impoverished. And that is there because the truth is, is that poverty is built into capitalism. You must have a certain amount of unemployed people in order for capitalism to work. You can't have full employment under capitalism because if you did, then everyone that worked could demand whatever wage they want. You have to have, you, you have, to have an army of unemployed workers to keep wages down. Now, obviously, we don't think that we're getting anywhere close to uh, full employment, but as the unemployment rates go down, 
uh, you'll see places like Financial Times and Wall Street Journal openly be worried about the unemployment rate going down because that means wages go up and that means stocks go down. So the truth being that there must be unemployment and there must be poverty for capitalism to exist. How do you tell that to the majority of the working class in the US, which is white? How do you tell the white working class that their poverty, their lack of affluence comes from their mistakes? You don't, you point at the other and say, look, here's an example of how poverty is created. You don't want to be that. Even though you're making 22000 a year, you're middle class and you're different than them. And that's the, that, and that's the, and so then there, so then that performance of whiteness has a politic that is in relationship to these ideas about people of color, that even when black folks perform it, sometimes we're doing. And, and I also wanted to make the distinction that I'm not talking about just diction and, you know, and, and certain, uh, and, and a, a certain way of speaking. In this thing, we're talking about uh, something else that's a little harder to capture. That's why uh, it says, you know, I'm not talking about Will Smith white. That's not white. That's just proper. Um, so, yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, another question? Anybody? Hi, my name is Misha. Um, I just wanted to know, does or did mass incarceration kind of play a part of the inspiration for the workhorse or the, yeah, or the idea of them being imprisoned and working for a certain amount or for free as labor? Well, I think it was more, um, it, I, I think that, you're talking about worry-free and then the development later of the, the that we find out about later of the Echo Sapiens. I think that it was more about trying to show how capitalism in general uh, uh, pivots off the exploitation of labor and using that to using using that more extreme situation, which we do see in prison today, but it wasn't just about expose, because sometimes when we expose, just talk about what happens in prisons, everybody else thinks, well, I'm free. And this is more about talking about how exploitation across the board works. And I, I should say that also the absurd thing in this movie is that worry free is happening in the US, but it actually already is happening all over the world that US company, US corporations are taking part in it. This is how you know there are, there's a lot of labor that happens in this way so yeah and and the equisapiens were um what we're all turning into which is more efficient monsters like where you're not even you know you're supposed to feel unproductive if you go take a shit without doing an email at the same time and you know or, you know, and, 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 and our whole social life is commodified, like just us sending a message to a friend, you want to go to the bar? Then they figure out what that means and how to sell that information and how to sell you more stuff and how to get you to think certain things. Um, and, uh, yeah. Okay, we think we have time for maybe a couple more. Hi, um, I'm Desiree. Incredible film, thank you for it. Um, I have a specific question about Tess's character, Detroit. Um, she's so um, uh, beautifully and unapologetically feminine in the film, uh, but one thing that I, and, and that includes sexual autonomy, right? But one thing that I can't figure out is um, the intention behind her and uh, the romance that she has with his friend. Yeah. Well, okay, I guess I wouldn't, classify uh, Squeeze as his friend. They were on the opposite sides of a struggle and he was selling them out 
right? Um, but I, yeah, I think that that has to do with that's what she wanted, right? She, you know, she, um, that was somebody that she felt at that time was she had an affinity for, and um, and you know she wasn't going to hide it or anything, and it didn't have to do with. I don't think, it, you know, I I don't think it had to do with her. It, it wasn't like she was trying to use that to get back with Cassius or doing that because of Cassius. It it was clear that they had something. Um, that they were interested in with each other. I think the only reason I didn't have it keep going is because we already like established him as a character that kind of moves from town to town. And uh, but yeah, I think that that also I would say that these characters I wrote most the main ones as myself, right? Just they're different parts of me. Um, I think Tessa is. Uh, Detroit's character um, comes out in a certain way because I wrote that about that side of me that's the artist trying to struggle with, you know, whether their art actually can do something or whether it's, um, you know, what it, in, uh, or whether it's helping a movement or not. And then Cassius is another aspect of that, which is just a person trying to figure out what their life means, and then there's the organizer part. So her uh, kind of ideological uh, back and forth early on with Squeeze, and then kind of the coming together of that is kind of those that that contradiction between art and organizing playing itself out. Okay, we'll take one more question real quick here in the audience for Boots. Hello, sir. My name is Marquette. It was good seeing Mr. Fab in the movie. And All with right, the success so. of this film, is it easier to make your second film? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's how it works. I mean, I haven't made it yet, so. But I have the deals for, I'm doing, um, I'm creating a TV show um, with, uh, uh, with Michael Ellenberg, who uh, helped bring uh, Game of Thrones to HBO. I'm doing a uh, an episode of Guillermo del Toro's uh, horror anthology uh, that I'm writing and directing. Um, and then I uh, have a feature deal as well for writing and directing that, so. Cool earrings. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's awesome. Thank you, man. This is, again, we love the movie, and, and thank you for everything you've said. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. Thank you.